Turn with me this morning to Luke, this 22nd chapter. Luke, the 22nd chapter. God's already done a whole lot this morning, hasn't he? Amen. He has uh, done so much, so much, so much. Luke chapter 20. What did I say, 22? We'll start reading in the 24th, the 24th verse. I had some things on my heart recently. And uh, like I said last week, you know, it seems like, uh, because I I took notes, I've got notes and things from this past week and uh, some some, uh, areas that I thought I would be dealing with. But. You know, it's kind of like I said, everything disappears and this is what's left and what's left is what you get. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, now what I'm going to talk to you about this morning <clears throat> sounds a little bit odd, but you know, we've had a lot of teaching and a lot of uh, seminars and so forth in the last few years, especially on leadership Leadership, a lot of leadership teaching, very important, very, very important. But I want to talk to you this morning about fellowship. <laughs> you know, it, you can't have a leader if you don't have followers. <laughs> Amen. In any situation, in any endeavor, whether it's Christian or secular, but we're talking Christian, any Christian endeavor is a success based on the quality and the quantity of the followers. There has to be followers. You could say servants, but but we all serve. And we all should be following. And we all should be leading. You lead in some areas, but you have to follow in others. See A good example this morning, you know, well, I am the, I'm the apostle of the house. I'm the bishop. I'm the one that's the leader. But when the anointing came on Sherry, I followed her. I submitted to her. I submitted to the anointing that was on her. See? So that shows that sometimes you may be the leader and sometimes you may be the follower in any given situation. And we have to be willing to do both. But notice what Jesus said. It said in the 24th verse, and there was also a strife among them, that is the disciples, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be, but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat. But I am among you as he that serveth. What about that? Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. See, Jesus was a, Jesus was a leader. Would you say that's true? But did you know that Jesus was a follower? Did you know that the Bible says in Isaiah 53, that it talks about his faithful servant. Jesus was a servant. Mm Mm-hmm. He's, and you say, uh, who, was, who was Jesus' servant? The Father. He was just as much God as the Father was, but for the purpose of the kingdom and our salvation, he submitted himself and took a lower place, becoming a man. And when he was here, he didn't do his will. He did what the Father said. Amen. 
So could you say then that he was a follower, that he was a servant, that he was submissive? And in the 29th verse, he said, And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto you, unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do this morning is I want to go through uh, several things because in my heart, I've wanted to do more than I've been able to do. There have been some things in my heart for many, many years. Uh, I've always had a desire to hook up with other ministers and do something on a larger scale. I, I, to me, you know, it's like, uh, you know, the, the, the work in Nicaragua. Well, you know, my thinking is, you know, that uh, uh, the Lord provided an opportunity for me to come along and serve Apostle Jonas. It was a wonderful opportunity because I wasn't in charge of that ministry. I'm helping another man with his ministry. I'm the minister of health. I'm the follower. Right. I'm the servant. And that was good for me. It was good for you. Right. Amen. That, that brings me to the place that I can confidently say that I don't have to be the man. I don't have to be in charge. Right. You know, I'm not on some kind of a control uh, mission here, you know. I just, I just do what I've been called to do. Right. And the position, and I, I, I try to take the position to stand in the place that God's called me to stand. But I thought, you know, if you could get another church, so, so we came alongside him, helped him, but I thought, what if you could get another church? Boy, you could do more quicker, couldn't you? And what if you could get another church? And what if you could get another church and another church and another church and you had enough churches that whenever there was a project, when there, when there was a school or a church or an orphanage or anything that needed to be uh, built, why, 10 churches could do it a lot better and a lot faster than one or two. But here's the problem. And that's what I want to talk to you about today because, see, this filters all the way down to you and I. That can't happen. I tried and made efforts. I, I even met with ministers in this, in this uh, county, got them all together, and, and we talked about, uh, talked about uh, um, what we could do, having a big crusade. You know what I'm saying? Churches coming together and bringing in a speaker and so forth and so What came of it? Nothing. I even tried to get them, let's get together and pray. I didn't have any better sense back then. This is many years ago. I wouldn't do it now because I've learned a lot more. Because when you, when, whenever you uh, get together with a bunch of people to pray, you're going to wind up praying at the lowest level. Right. Amen. Right. Whatever the lowest level is, whatever, wherever they pray, if they're lower, then you're going to have to pray at that level. You can't pray at your level. And so, but I didn't think about that then. I was just trying to get people together. Because I know that, uh, you know, if you had some kind of fellowship and you all had the same purpose and you all had the same vision and all going in the same direction, you could accomplish a whole lot more for the kingdom. But that's not happened and the reason it's not happened is what I want to talk to you about today. Number one, because I've never been able to get anybody to, 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 to join up with me. And one of the things is, uh, I believe one of the first things is lack of trust. See, there has to be a leader, but you have to trust the leader. Now, some people are just, they don't trust anybody. And it just seems like it's natural for them. But some people don't trust because they've been hurt. They've been wounded. You know, somebody's already abused them. A leader, maybe a pastor, an overseer of the church, somebody that was in authority that should have had their best interest at heart, abused them. Now, that has happened many times because, see, a lot of people have come to this church down through the years, and they came from other churches where they were hurt and wounded. Right. Well, when they come in here hurt and wounded, see, whenever you leave a situation, you enter the next situation the way you left. So if you left a church hurt, you're going to go to the next church hurt. Right. 
If the last man hurts you, if the last pastor or bishop, if he hurts you, then the, then and you got that pain in you, you're going to bring that pain and that distrust under the leadership of the next minister, and you're not going to trust him. So one of the main issues is why people you can't get people to follow is because they have a lack of trust. Number two, a lot of times people won't follow you because they don't believe you've heard from God. And I understand that because how many times have people told you that God said when you found out that God didn't really say it? Hello out there? I'll be honest with you. I know I've missed it, but I have tried my best over the years. You know, it's just like some things I said yesterday. We were in prayer. And we were praying about the children. We were praying about, you know, the only way we're going to be able to really uh, change a culture is through the children. And you're not going to do that in one or two hours a week in church. There will be some fruit. Don't misunderstand me. There will be. But it, really, if you're going to change their lives, you're going to have to have uh, some kind of schooling. Well, I can't step out and do that. Not unless God says do it. I'd like to do it. I can, I've got a vision of it. I can see it. I know exactly what, what, what to do and how to, I mean, because I'm a builder. I know how to build. But see, you can't, you can't do that unless you know that you know that you know God said it. Because once you say God said it, there's no turning back. Mm -hmm. No matter what kind of war you go through, you still got to stick with what you said God said. Unless you're a man or woman enough to throw up your hands and say, my God, I missed it. See, there's some things, there's some things that, do, that don't matter a whole lot. And there's some things you don't do unless you know. I didn't come into the ministry until I knew that I knew that I knew, and you could never take it away from me. You could never, you couldn't beat me long enough. You couldn't, you couldn't do anything to make me doubt that I'm an apostle. You can't take it out of me. Amen. You, because I know. I know. See, well, how do I know? I know I was there. You weren't there. <laughs> but I was there when God called me. Amen. And I know I wasn't jumping to try to get into some ministry. Well, a lot of people don't believe that God said because they've heard so many times that people have said God said when they knew it wasn't God. And so that causes a problem then. Uh, and it hurts people from being able to believe in the next guy. Number three, a lot of people won't follow because they just don't see where you're going. They don't see it. Uh, and some people don't want to see it. But some people don't see it. Uh, some people are not supposed to go with you. Mm -hmm. But see, in order, see, here's the thing about it, guys. When you look around this church, See, I, I was sent here. I was sent here because that's the main characteristic of the apostle is that they're sent. But it doesn't make any difference how sent I am or anybody else. Whether this thing is successful or makes it or not is based on, again, the quality and the quantity of followers of servants or people that are willing to serve people that are willing to submit themselves to somebody else's vision, somebody else's leadership. Amen. Amen. Now the leader has a great responsibility. God help me. He has to be, uh, he has to be sterling in character. He has to, he has to live right. He can't mishandle money. He can't, he can't jump up every Sunday and say, the Lord said this or the Lord said that. He can't be immoral. He can't be a bully. He can't be a dictator. Amen. See, uh, because people won't follow that kind of thing. Number four is they, they just don't agree with the vision. They don't want to agree with where you're going. So they're not going to follow if you're not going where they want to go. Let me say this. Any, if God has given you a spiritual authority, and everybody should have one, supposed to have one, 
If God has put a spiritual authority in your life, first of all, you understand that that person is a human being. They're not perfect. They can miss it. But all through the years, all through the years, some people say it to my face. Some people say it behind my back and I hear about it. But they'll say things, and really, you know, when you think about all the people that have been in this church and have left this church, they basically left because they didn't agree with me. They didn't agree with something I preached. They didn't, pre they didn't agree with my delivery. Uh, they didn't agree with uh, 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 my decisions. See? But basically, they leave because they didn't agree with me. And the word clearly says in Amos 3.3, 3, and that is that uh, can two walk together except they be agreed? Well, the answer, of course, is no. Now, we don't ever have to agree with one another on everything. As a matter of fact, we never are going to do that. But when a spiritual authority in your life, one that you know that God's placed there, when you disagree with them, you need to, before you decide, before you just right off the cuff, when they say something or they make a decision, see, right off the cuff, you say, I don't agree with that. Uh, you need to be careful about that. Because, see, you need to base your disagreement on something. You need to ask yourself, if I disagree, why do I disagree? See, why? Because, see, you can't just disagree for the sake of disagreeing. Some people are just absolutely disagreeable. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was talking to Brother Terry the other day, you know, and he's, he's talking, he's talking about some situations he'd gone through, you know, and so forth, and uh, about uh, this, this particular person who's working in the church, and he had to talk, actually had to, uh, you know, dismiss them and all that kind of stuff. And, it, and his word to me was, they just always looking for something. There's some people like that. They're just always looking for something to disagree with you about. Amen. Well, if a spiritual authority is saying things and making decisions. and See, here's what you have to understand. Uh, there are many translations of the Bible. I don't know how many. Probably hundreds, I guess, I would assume. I mean, I don't know that many of them. I know we think about King James, New King James, NIV, American Standard Version, uh, the Amplified, did I say Amplified? Um, Weiss Translation, Williams Translation, A.S. Worrell, tra uh, Worrell uh, Translation, and the Message, the Message Bible. Now, see, all of these Bibles phrase things differently and use different wording. But hopefully, the message doesn't change. See, the message, when the message uh, comes forth, it can come forth with a lot of different words, with a lot of different phrases. It doesn't change the message. So then, for instance, the way I would say something is not necessarily the way somebody else would say something. Trust me. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's why when I go somewhere else and preach, they apologize to the people before I get up. And they tell them, now, you've got to understand, he's different. <laughs> but see, if I was not different, I just don't like to be, I just don't want to be a cookie that's cut from the same cook, cookie cutter as everybody else. I can hear somebody preach and just about tell you what denomination they belong to. Because they're all the same. I, I can tell you what ministry they come up under because of the way they, way they act, even the way they phrase things. Well, we all, do, we all pick up things from different people. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen. But we all are unique. And guess what? God knew that before he called me. I said, God knew that before. And so, you know what God says? Now, see, I use the word stupid a whole lot. It's one of my favorite words. <laughs> but 
Well, if you look at the King James, you don't see stupid in there too many times. Amen? I don't know if you ever see the word stupid in the King James Bible. But honey, I think if you read the Message Bible and some of these other translations, it's filled with the word stupid. See, these translations, many of them came back years ago when the terminology wasn't, wasn't what it is today. Because language is always changing. Always changing. Gay used to be happy. You know. Cool used to be between hot and cold. <laughs> but not anymore. So then, you know, if people, and so what happens is a lot of times, if you don't say things the way people want you to say them, or think you ought to say them, then they'll throw the whole message out. They don't hear the message, they just heard what you said, the words, the words. And see, every time I get an accusation or every time somebody disagrees with me, I go to the Word. Hmm? And I find out, you know, that in the Bible, I look at Jesus and I look at Paul especially. Those are my two guys right there. I don't mean the guys in a disrespect, but the Lord Jesus. I didn't mean that. But I look at their teachings and I look at what they said. And so, see, this is what happens. Sometimes, for instance, it's, you call it exaggeration, but really it's not. It, it is an exaggeration in some point. But for instance, here's, here's the thing. I looked in the, I, look, I was looking for something in the cabinets. <laughs> and <laughs> I do this to Geraldine all the time. And I looked up there and, I, and, I, and we got several bottles of a salad dressing, right? And I said, my God. I said, well, we got 14,932 <laughs> bottles of salad dressing in here. And I ain't had a salad in a month. <laughs> of course, she, you know what her situation is. And, but do you really think that I had 14,000 uh, bottles of uh, salad dressing? Now, some would say we would call that a lie. That's not a lie. A lie has to do with deception. Right. What I said was an expression, see, of my feelings toward having so much salad dressing. Because she knew what I was saying. Everybody in the house knew what I was saying. And it wasn't a lie because they knew we didn't have 14,000 bottles. I do the same. I do it all the time. I'll just be honest to you. I do it all. Huh? It's what? Hyperbole. That's what I do. I hyperbole. <laughs> but it's not, it, it's not a lie. Because see, if, it, if, it's, if it's a lie, Jesus lied. Anybody here believe Jesus lied? Did you know, did you know that Jesus said things like this? He said, if your eye offend you, pluck it out. He said, if your hand offend you, cut it off. Did he mean, first of all, how could your eye, your eye is controlled by your brain. So what's he talking? He couldn't be literally talking about plucking out your eye, cutting off your hand. Your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost. That wasn't what, and besides that, did you see anywhere in the scripture from there to Revelation where anybody ever plucked their eye out or anybody ever cut their hand off? No, what Jesus was doing, he was, he was giving them a message. And he was using strong phrases and strong words to get his message across. As a matter of fact, in that day when he said that, it would be like it is today when we say like, that guy will give you the shirt off his back. Well, I can't even imagine a scenario where somebody would give you a shirt off his back. Well, that person right there would take a bullet for you. Well, you don't know if he would or not. 
That guy would cut off his right arm for you. We know those. We, we use those terms all the time, and there's a message in it. You see what I'm saying? But the way we're expressing the message, and see, that's why I do this a lot of times, is when I want to express something. See, if I just stand up here and I say, you know, that, uh, you know, I don't know. I can't even think of anything right now, but... Uh, well, yesterday I was making these statements. Uh, I was talking about parents. And I said, uh, parents, you've got to understand something about parents. Parents are stupid. They're crazy. They're asinine. Why? Because they don't think, they think their children are perfect. And in any conflict or any situation, they always take the side of somebody's abusing my child. I'm still finding out things about my child, about my children that they did when they were children that I wouldn't have thought that you couldn't, I, it never crossed my mind. Now, do I mean by that that all parents are really stupid. Do I, mean, do I really mean by that they're all crazy? Well, they're not crazy. Not, not, you know what I'm saying? What I'm, what I'm doing is I am using terminology and phrases to get a, 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 an intense message across. See, it's more intense. It's, it, see, it's, it's more likely to stick with you. If I, use, if I use those things, it's more, more because you need to be marked because I know that when you walk out of here this morning, you're going to forget 25% of what I said before you get home. And before it's over, you're probably going to retain about 10%. Amen. But if I call you stupid, <laughs> you won't forget that. Amen. Yeah. So before I well, I would just start disagreeing with your spiritual authority. I believe I would stop and at least think through it a little. Now I know that thinking is a new concept to most believers, but you can do it. Hello. So I would be. I would just be very, very careful about the, why do, sometimes I will, not only will I even call it uh, whatever she said, uh, but it's to get a message across, to get a message across. And the message is not going to come across. If I stand up here and, and, and I'm very uh, mundane and I say, well, you know, many parents uh, think that their children can do no wrong. You're going to forget that before you get out the door. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Yes. But if I express it in such a way that it irritates you, <laughs> you're more likely to remember it. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be real plain with you. I mean, Compared to other preachers and the way they preach, um, I'm amazed that you're here. Because <laughs> I don't fit their mold. I don't talk like they do. But I, but, I, but I get a message across. I am a communicator. Hello out there. So some, the people won't follow you because they don't agree with everything you say. Well, first of all, you probably don't even know what I said. Amen. All right. Number five. They won't follow because they think you're in it for yourself. And the reason is because, see, they don't know you. And the Bible says, know them that labor among you. Do you know, the? I believe it was the Lord. I, I know I heard these words in the night season a few years ago. And he said that the, the, the church will never be any stronger than relationships in the church. Uh, 
It's important that you love one another in the house. I mean, not just in the house, but I mean, it's important that you love one another, that you trust one another. If we're going to have a team atmosphere and if we're going to get something done together. See, this is what you got to understand. An apostle is a builder. I used to build houses. And you know, there was only about four of us. There was three that worked. There's three of us who worked for this one man and we did 90% 90% of the work. But when there was hard, when there was heavy lifting and when there were, we were framing in certain situations, there was always guys down at the uh, hardware store at a certain place down at Athens. Uh, what do they call it? Five forks. They're standing around day laborers. They, 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 uh, they want them to work. And so we go down there. We can't provide work for them all the time, but we need some help. And so they're ready to go. And so you take them out there and you have people you can pick up. But mainly three of us working for one man, we built, we, we would build a house, just us. But see, here's, here's what you got to understand. Uh, everybody had to work to get that house built. And different, different people could do different things. See, like for instance, one guy, Rayford, he made sure every day he was the man, nobody else but him. He got every tool out of the truck, and at the end of the day, he made sure that tool was back in the truck. You can lose a lot of money in tools. But that was one of his jobs. That was his his assignment was to make sure there was never any tools left on the job. And since that was his assignment, then he's the only one that gets the tools out. Okay. I was a saw man. The reason I was a saw man because that's I, could, I was the best. Right. I'm the best Eddie's ever seen. I'm better than Eddie. <laughs> Amen. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, look, if you're going to build, and that's what apostles are, builders, if you're going to build, you've got to have people working besides you. You're the overseer. You tell them what to do. You give them their assignments, but then they have to do their assignment. So therefore, when you look around, you see this church and this operation, it's not because you just got an apostle. It's because you've got a lot of people that are followers and servants, and they're the ones that make things happen. I can oversee it. I can even give assignments, but I can't do the work and I don't care how anointed and how gifted I am. If I do not have people who are willing and believe and people that do trust. Are you listening to me? You got to, if you're going to build, you got to have people, you got to have people that believe you did hear from God. You got to have people uh, that do see what you see. You got to have people that agree with you. You got to have you got to have people that know that you're not in it for yourself. Another reason people won't follow, and the reason you can't get them to do work and do something for the kingdom, is that uh, they want to know right off the bat what's in it for me. We have been brainwashed through the different ministries. And so every time we turn the TV on, every time we sit under a ministry, it's all about what can you do for me? That's right. Yes. Was it John F. Kennedy that said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what your, you can do for your country? Yes. How about it, guys? Did you just come to church to get fed or to get uh, maybe, uh, you know, your conscience eased? Do you come just to hear or do you come with the kingdom in mind? What what, what can I do instead of what's in it for me? That that what's in it for me uh, that most churches and most ministries are built on is very weak and very shallow. No wonder they're falling into all kinds of false doctrine and immorality. A weak message, a weak message produces a weak church. Number seven is they have to, the reason they won't follow is because they have to be in control. They can't submit to authority. It's either my way or no way. 
Usually what happens here, and that comes in with the religious spirit, has to do with the Jezebel spirit. Amen? And uh, basically a lot of times what happens is, is people get wounded and hurt, and so they have to be in control so they won't get hurt anymore. If I can control every relationship that I'm in, if I can be in control of it, then I can guard myself and make sure you don't hurt me. Because if I see anything in you that might hurt me, then I'm going to get you out of my life. Number eight. Oh, boy. They, they think they know more than you. Have we ever had anybody in this church? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm seeing the list right now. They thought they knew so much more than me. I told you the other day, I've never seen a person yet, never met a person yet that knew as much as they thought they knew. <laughs> Everybody knows something. And everybody knows something that nobody else does. And people like to talk over, over people's heads sometimes. If you're going to run the carnage on a house, how are you going to determine the bearing line? Huh? I know. You don't know. Right. I know. Because I used to do it all the time. Right. First of all, you don't even know what carnage is, do you? <laughs> and you don't know what the bearing line is either, do you? Does that make me smarter than you? Yeah. <laughs> See, Kathy knows I'm smarter than her. And by the way, didn't y'all have an anniversary I saw? Yeah. Well, listen, just, huh? 21 years. 21 years. <laughs> well, Barry should be given the, <laughs> the Congressional Medal of Honor. I didn't hear that. I don't think I wanted to, did I? Where am I at? I've got to be in control. Oh, they know, they think they know more than you do. And I think, you know, and see, you might not, not everybody's an apostle, not everybody's a builder, not everybody doesn't have an anointing, but, you know, People who know so much more than me and they don't mind letting me know that they know so much more than me. I always have the question, I know you're the smartest person on the planet, but what have you ever built? What have you ever accomplished? What have you ever done except just accept something somebody handed to you? See, just because you got stuff don't mean you believed it in. Doesn't mean you even worked it in. Some people get a free ride, friend. Amen. So I don't know. You know, everybody knows something, but nobody knows everything. Number nine, the reason is, see, if you're going to, if you're going to build something, you've got to have a team spirit. Uh, number nine is, is a lot of people can't follow because they're, uh, they're ball hogs. You know what a ball hog is? I'm going to tell you. Some of you don't know. In eighth grade, uh, I knew, uh, uh, well, it was, it was your uncle, Johnny. And he was a year ahead of me, and he was playing eighth grade basketball. And so uh, there was another guy on the team. And I heard, because I didn't go to the games. I played the next year, but I didn't play that year. Uh, I heard that this one guy on the team scored 26 points. Eighth grader. Now, that's, that's a lot of points. And uh, so I thought, wow, he must be a good player. Yeah. But what I found out later was he was not that great a player. He was a ball hog. 
because his mission was to see how many points he could get. It wasn't about the team. It wasn't even about winning. It was all about him being the star of the show. That's the reason a lot of people can't follow because they can't be the star of the show. People want to do what they want to do, not what needs to be done. A real follower, a real servant is not, they don't, they don't, they don't pick and choose what they get to do. They're going to be gifted in certain areas, but sometimes you have to do stuff that's not necessarily your gifting. As an apostle of this house, man, I built, when, when we first started, I built, there's still walls down there that I built. Right. Built walls, hung the paneling, done everything. Built all those rooms on that end down there. Well, we done tore a bunch of them out now. Changed it, but, but I did it. There was even a time when I led singing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All these things are not necessarily my gifting and my anointing, but somebody had to do it, and it needed to be done. That's right. Preacher came to me and wanted me to hire him. He's the same age I am. Wanted me to hire him. And he just lives near here, but he wouldn't even come to this church. But he wants me to hire him as an assistant pastor in this church. He had destroyed every church he'd ever been to. They either run him off, some of them didn't even exist today. But he said, you know, what I want to do, I think, I, you know, what I believe is is people ought to be, uh, they need to function in their gifting. And my gifting is pulpit ministry and counseling. And I'm thinking, wow, I wish that's all I had to do was preach and counsel. That'd be awesome. That'd be wonderful. He didn't even believe what we were doing here. All he wanted was a place to fulfill his ministry and get paid for it. He wasn't a servant. He wasn't a follower. Now, you know what would have happened if I'd have hired him and I had to kill him. Well, there you go again. You're saying killing, isn't it? Did I get my message across? <laughs> For all you ignorant people, that means that I would have to uh, excommunicate him from my presence. <laughs> we got a lot of number 10. There's a lot of starters, but not too many finishers. Bible says something like this. Jesus said it, he that put his hands to the plow and looketh back is not fit for the kingdom of God. One of the things I said when, when Oasis was started, I said, you know, it's honeymoon time now. After a while, it's going to turn into work. Then you decide if it's worth it or not. Then you decide, is this what God said? Then you have, that's what, that's what. And you know how long it's been going? Two years? Been about three years now and they're still going strong. Are you listening to me? The honeymoon doesn't have to be over if you keep tuned in to what God said. Amen. And let me just say this. See, there's a lot of things that if you don't know God said it, that there's always going to be a war. There's always giants in the land. That's why when, you, when God speaks to you so spectacularly, not just supernaturally, but you know that you know that you know to where you can't doubt it, the reason he gives you that is because there's going to be times when you're going to need a word to hang on to. That's right. That's right. If I didn't have certain words, if God had not visited me, I'd have quit a long time ago. Yes. Yes. But every time it looks like I can't go any further, I go back to the word. I go back, I revisit where he called me. Because then what I find there is I find faith in that word. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And I find the faith and the grace. Yes. Yes. 
that I need to keep going. Amen. Yes. Number, the next thing is number 11, right? Boy, I'm getting doing these numbers today. I'm doing good. <laughs> number 11 is some people are just lazy. They're just lazy. They're just fleshly. They're just carnal. Fulfilling their purpose and their destiny means nothing to them. Let me say this. You have two assignments on your life, whether you believe it or accept it or not. You have an assignment where the church is concerned. We are all members of the body of Christ. Members in particular. We are particular members. What member are you? Where do you fit? What is your function? I'm not talking about the universal church. I'm talking about the local church. You have a ministry in the local church. You have a gifting. You have a place. Does that mean anything to you? You also have a kingdom assignment. That means that there are different areas out there that God wants you in for his purpose. You have a job, and on that job you see people and you know people that the rest of us would never see and know. And listen, wherever you're working or whatever business you're in, then that is your kingdom assignment if that's what, if God puts you there. And by, by doing that, you have a realm of authority. That is part of your realm of authority. What does that mean? That means you can exercise your authority in that situation. You can change things in that situation. You can pray with faith in that situation. See, one of the things somebody said one time, I was preaching on prayer, and I was talking about when you are praying within your, your sphere, you're praying within your, uh, your place that God has placed you, that, that if you're that, that a lot of times it's hard to pray for people outside of your realm of authority. That's right. See, I can pray. Can I just tell you this? In the church right here, I can pray for some people with more faith and with more authority than I can others. That's right. Based on their submission yes. and their value to the church. I can't pray for everybody the same. Right. Can't do it. There's been times when people that were committed to this church ran into great bad situations. And I would, I would, I would say immediately, I said, we can change that. Right. We can change it. Number 11 is just people, some people are just lazy and fleshly and carnal. They just want to do their thing and the purpose of their kingdom assignment and their, uh, and what this person said a few years ago was, I don't know if I agree with him or not. I'm not sure he's right about that. And then they went on to say, well, because I work so-and-so and I pray in there, da, 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 and she didn't hear what I said. She's working there. She's working there. That is her realm of authority. She does have authority in that place. God does her hear her from that place. Amen. Yes, amen. There again, there again, somebody heard something that wasn't said. Now, are you ready for some pain? If you went home today, And take your Sunday nap. And didn't wake up. Or when you woke up, you woke up in heaven. What kind of void would you leave?
See this glass of water? See my finger? What changed? Nothing. 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 How valuable are you to God? Because the only way you can be valuable to God is to be valuable to his church. Now here's what we have to do around here. Okay. If I understand it right, Matthew and Casey, y'all are moving to Colorado. Are they going to be missed? Oh, yes. Yes. Are they going to leave a void? Yes. Do we hate to see them go? Yes. I don't even want to think about it. How long have you been here, Casey? Year. Year. Year and a few months. Uh, Matthew's been here how long? Forever. I remember when he came in my office and all those years and neither one of them has ever caused me any problem and they came in working and been working ever since, serving ever since, submitted to authority, follow leadership, follow instructions, impacting children's lives. Children that will never be the same because they laid down their lives. So what we have to do is uh, we, have to be- we have to become so valuable. This will work on your job too. Yeah. That you, we can't afford to fire you. Right. We can't afford to let you go. Right. Is that you? Would you be missed? Are you holding a place in God's economy of things? Are you holding a place that if you went to heaven today, there would be a void? Now, I'm I'm thinking about this a lot lately because, see, I used use them as, as an example. I jokingly said to Ms. Gail, Ms. Gill, because she helps me so much, not just in the church, but I'm not good with paperwork and all that foolishness. I mean, it's just about in this day and time, everybody needs their own lawyer. I mean, or bookkeeper or whatever. And anyway, so I'll go in. She helps me so much. I said, Ms. Gill, don't you dare die before I do. <laughs> don't do it. Just don't do it. So when Ms. Gill gets, starts getting sick, I start praying. Because I can't afford for her to go to heaven right now. (laughs) If she did, would she be missed? Oh, Jesus. Many of you, I could say the same thing. Many, many, many of you. I know this is heavy, but you need to think. Because, see, it's better for you to be faced with this today than when you stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to say, you had an assignment. You had a gift. But you didn't value it. You let other things steal it from you. Oh, my I think about all the musicians that sold their, 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 their gift. Yeah. 
What we have to do around here now is we have to be working on raising up somebody that can fill that void when you leave. We need all of us that have positions and that do have value and are important for, the, for this ministry. Yes. You need to be training somebody else. So, because listen, we're, hey old folks, <laughs> we're not going to be here forever. I don't want to go to heaven and this thing just be over with. Because I've seen that. I've seen all these revivals come and go, come and go, come and go. And now all these revivals that was going on in the 90s, if you go back and look at them right now, there's nobody showing up anymore. While they were at the, see, there's a nail and a flow. And people try to function on that, on that high place and they're not going to be there forever. Things plateau, and then they go the other way. Now there's a lot of them sitting around with multi-million dollar buildings that they built when everything was high and mighty. And now it's over with, and they got the buildings to pay for, and they got two or 300 people instead of three or 4,000. It's been done over and over and over again. Stand up with me. To be here, you don't know what it takes to be here for 28 years and still be going strong. That's right. Doing more than we've ever done for the kingdom. A lot of folks can run well for a while. Hallelujah. Father, we love you today and thank you. To God be the glory. Lord, I pray that every heart would be receptive of the message. That every heart, Father God, would uh, contemplate, to meditate, to think upon what's been said today. I pray, Father God, that decisions would be made. I, th I pray, Father God, that thoughts have been provoked, that, that Lord, that minds have been challenged. Oh, Father, you can turn it around. You can turn it around. I've seen it happen. I've seen you do it before, and you can do it again, Lord. You can visit a person's life. You can do it. You can do it through the Word, through the Spirit, but you can do it. And then, Father God, they can make the right decision. I thank you for helping us today. Lord, I know it's not a shouting type atmosphere, but Lord, there was a message. I pray that your word would not return void, but accomplish that which you please. Prosper in the thing where until you send it. I pray that every heart, every life, God, would be touched today. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, God bless you. Prayer at 6. Evening worship at 7.